Good morning, Chris, and a good afternoon, Eric Oliver, and a good evening, Debbie. And uh, thank you to each and every one of you for being online with us today. Uh, the current exhibition, Joint Ambience, Elvin Blasky and uh, the Architecture Association in the UTR Museum presents drawing collected by Elvin Blasky when he was chairman at AA from 1971 to 1990. Since the UTR Museum's opening in 2016, in addition to the exhibition in museum, we also organize a series of forum and lectures in various ways that focus on the thing of future and the city. And also, the museum has always been committed to promotion of architecture education. Therefore, the UTR Museum have organized five seminars alongside with this exhibition, uh, including drawing ambience, people, publication, and pedagogy, and uh, the platform to explore how Boyaski have influenced the world for our audience. And today, tonight, the final section, platform, how museum curate to dispute this uh, distribute and uh, integrate ideas. A key platform to engage with the public, museum, and the layer curatorial practice conveys ideas, explore issue, and uh, expand the layer inference. Just as Boyaski pioneered a series of exhibition on the scene of architecture architecture uh, 40 years ago. So today, as a key platform for engagement with the public, we would like to know how museum can communicate idea and explore issue and expand their public impacts through their curatorial practice. Uh, today, uh, this seminar is gratefully supported and sponsored by Asia Cultural Council. Council. I also would like to thank the partners of the exhibition, Nicholas Boyaski and uh, Nicola Maffi, for generosity in providing this variable exhibit, and our curator, Jim and Eager, and uh, our exhibition advisor, Devi, uh, who was also the moderator of this event today. And in the end, I would also like to thank our speakers today, uh, Eric, Chris, and Oliver, who I am sure will give us a wonderful talk today. 
and thank you again to all our audience for attending online and uh, we wish you all the best in enjoying the seminar. Thank you. <laughs>
，陈伯康是现在鹿特丹新艺术机构的总监。他同时是二零一二年到二零一九年的香港西九龙 M Plus 设计与建筑策展人，啊，博康是一个独立策展人、评论家。那么他同时开始了我们现在知道的北京设计周，呃，他担任最早的这个开创的呃这个呃创意总监。Eric Chen is the artistic director of Rotterdam's at the New Institute and the outgoing curatorial director of Design Miami. He has served an international reputation as an independent curator, working with museums, biennales, and other venues globally. He has also served as professors of practice and director of curatorial lab at College of Design and Innovation. At Tongji University in Shanghai, from 2012 to 2019, Chen was the founding lead curator for design and architecture, and later curator at large for M Plus, a museum for visual cultures in Hong Kong's West Kowloon Culture District. Prior to founding M Plus, Chen was the first creative director of Beijing Design Week. He has organized dozens of projects and exhibitions internationally, in addition to serve on numerous juries, and as a curatorial advisor to the Shenzhen Bai City Biennale of Urbanism and Architecture, the Cooper the Cooper Hewitt Museum Triennale, the Guangzhou Design Biennale. Chen is the author of Brazil Modern, a book published by Monacelli Press in 2016. And has been a frequent contributor to the New York Times, Wallpaper, Architecture Record, and other publications. Welcome, Eric. It's wonderful to have you again here to see you in Taiwan, as although you're far away. And last but never the least、um, is our old friend Oliver Elser,、uh, who、uh, who produced this wonderful, wonderful exhibition at JUT SOS Brutalism. Uh, Save the Country Master. Oliver Ayers is a Deutsche Bauhaus curator. Besides curating, he is also a design critic. His、uh, SOS Design Chaos Management Exhibition was exhibited last year in Taipei. His exhibition is now on display in the world. At the, the German Architecture Museum in Frankfurt, and was curator of Making Helmet, the German Pavilion at 2016 Venice Architecture Biennale. He studied architecture at Technical University in Berlin.、Uh, 2012 to 13, he was guest professor for seniography at Polyte- Polytechnic at Mainz. At DAM. Elser created exhibitions about brutalism's concrete monsters, the DAM founding and postmodernism in Frankfurt, architectural model in the 20th century, and the architects Enric、uh, Schilling and、uh, Simon Ungers. He has worked as an architecture critic for newspapers and magazines, and has written numerous articles for catalogs and books. He is co-author of a book of the role of architecture. In Tato, Germany's most popular crime series, I hope I got it right. Elser joined forces with the artist Oliver Croy to develop the project Santa Mutele, that was shown at the Art Biennale in Venice in 2013. I think that means special models.、Um, in 2019, he was an M Plus Design Trust Research Fellow in Hong Kong. So with that,、um, we, I let's.、Uh, I would like to really welcome three distinguished uh, speakers, uh, which uh, has wonderful uh, uh, contents uh, that I already had a privilege of pr- preview、uh, last week when we have the test. And with that,、uh, Chris,、uh, w- would you like to go ahead and、um, share with us your thoughts? Thank you, Chris. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So I've been thinking about how to. Um, go about this because I'm I'm a little bit of an odd bird here because I'm not a curator I'm not a museum、um, expert but here I am so 
I think I have to start a little with a, a um, say a personal note, which explains why I'm here. Um, and, and it's 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 a story that started um, 30 years ago, um, where uh, a, a new friend, uh, Nicholas Bayarsky, uh, and, and Nicola uh, Murphy um, invited me um, after we had taught together as new professors at RISD to uh, visit them in their their home in London and um, subsequently yearly visits were the norm. And uh, in the background, you know, against all these great events and dinners um, were these beautiful drawings um, throughout the house. And, um, and this was the original um, home of Alvin, uh, Nicholas's father and mother. Um, and you know, not knowing better, you know, we had talked about, oh, it would be nice to have these things shown. And I thought, well, why not ask the RISD Museum and, the, and Jan Howard, who is a dear colleague uh, in charge of prints and drawings said, well, uh, I have no idea what to do with something that I have, I'm not an expert in. I'm not an expert in architectural drawings, but uh, over the years, the conversation kept going back and forth. And finally you could say, magic happened um jan visited uh nicholas and nicola and the rest is history and um uh, and this is how drawing ambiance was launched and why it ended up um in washington university because of igor Marj marjanovic um in part and at RISD, which was jan howard's um part of the of the um of the of the journey i'm telling this because I, it, it's an experience from inside. In other words, I had no, I had no distance from the work. I just knew it as something. These were important and beautiful drawings from an architect's point of view. But I do want to sort of come around and say this bringing of work out from, let's say, a private collection, uh, with in terms of architectural drawing, is particularly complicated or complex because architectural drawings as opposed to studio art, are not drawn um, uh, for a gallery. In other words, they're not intended, their, their future destination is not intended. So they are particularly, you could say, homeless in the sense that they remain somewhat um, in limbo uh, as curatorial items. In other words, architectural drawings are instrumental and they never lose their instrumentality even when they're hanging in a gallery. So that makes it particularly challenging to think about what to do with them as a as a curator. So I really have only two points, and this is something that um, you know maybe as an architect I have my my biases. Um, but one point is to say that the the power of uh, the setting, the context, um, is something that is perhaps not yet um, you know always fully realized, uh, and I want to show. For uh, just a few images here of how the setting can curate architectural work and architectural drawings in particular. And then I want, we'll show a few images of how curat curatorial decisions can propel um, architectural uh, drawings uh, far further than perhaps they were first intended. So I'll share a screen here. Um, we'll see if this works. I'm going to try to, hopefully I can uh, change the view here to uh, full screen. If someone can give me some feedback, because I know I can, I see my full screen, but let me just go on. Okay. So the first thing I want to show um, in terms of this journey, because it's also, I got entangled also in the curatorial aspect in part because the original show in, in Washington University, St. Louis was designed by uh, Nicola and Nicholas. And when RISD- and, um, Excuse me, Chris. Hello? Actually, yes. we don't see anything. At least I don't see anything on, uh, on the screen of your- uh, of Okay, your, uh, let me try again. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to try the entire screen this bit, see if that. Uh...
yeah, this will, this I think may work. Um, how's that? Wonderful, it worked. Wonderful. Great, great. So um, this story here is it goes on. So this is the, so after Nicholas and Nicola had uh, done the design and uh, installed the the exhibition in its first location, Washington University. Um, the 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 um, the challenge of bringing it to RISD um, was partially um, shared with me. So um, uh, our firm, I should say, um, which uh, had the you could say the modest um, uh, task of taking the pieces and the curated elements and their settings and their exhibition cases um, and finding a kind of architectural a simple architectural expression for the new gallery and i just want to show this because it's it helps explain what i mean by 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 um, the importance of setting for architectural work because these drawings to be simply placed on a wall in a gallery uh, it wouldn't suffice and the setting has a has an enormous role in uh giving the sort of say the lay public a, an access to these drawings which have perhaps been done in a studio uh, as part of a uh, as uh, David said, part of an architectural machine um, that had been not something in public view. So architectural drawings themselves are quite mysterious to the public because they're, again, they're not representations of finished things. They're, they're the emergence of ideas. Um, they are in a way in flux and um, can um, um, be understood in many, many ways. So how you present them becomes especially uh, um, important. So what we did is a very simple element. You can see it in the room to set off the the um, the uh, the idea that this is simply another gallery with another set of drawings shown. And so this this single element started to organize a room to make it a spatial experience. So the um, museum has limited, let's say, um, architectural. Uh, potential because even the entry to it is 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 quite modest to the main gallery um, but here we see the elements that you will you're all familiar with the name the 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 drawings the uh the layout uh and so here you see the frame and so it became important as part of let's say curation to create a very physical uh, experience so that as you walked in your eye would be drawn in that you would see framing views but they would be constantly shifting as you moved around the space. This was the whole idea, um, was that there was a very uh, clear, you say tactile um, uh, uh, component to the exhibition so that this was not simply gallery art that one viewed, but that was, sim that was actually much more uh, something that one engaged by moving around uh, and moving close and far and looking through. So that became an important cue. Um, there's even a mysterious opening cut through allowing a kind of, um, I would say, shortcutting to happen. So as the show has moved around the world, um, certain elements continue to be, be, you know, the reference elements, but it's quite interesting just, re, you know, researching a little bit online and looking at the different um, settings that the show has found itself in. It gives the title of the show, uh, Drawing Ambiance, uh, a kind of, let's say, another dimension. So each of these shows, in a way, is the construction of an ambiance, in, in, uh, an ambiance that creates a setting to, in a way, absorb the material in a different way um, than simply as a didactic thing to be seen on a wall. So there's that whole dimension of, you could say, the setting which provides an enormous power to become a platform uh, not often talked about. So um, in terms of the curatorial aspect, perhaps the, the best known you know, iconic show is the one at the Museum of Modern Art in 1932, the international style. And the curatorial component there was quite, quite uh, um, in our eyes from looking back, we can see it's actually a, quite a fiction that was created. This was not the sum total of, of what was going on in the architecture scenes between the 20s and 30s. 
um, notably Frank Lloyd Wright um, withdrew from the show because he simply didn't want to be part of it. Um, but there was a lot of architects that were simply excluded. So the the curators had a strong hand in uh, um, simply selecting a, call it a narrative, um, and that narrative proved very powerful, as we know, and it had a tremendous effect on the history of architecture, the, even the thinking about architecture. And parenthetically, I just note here how the setting is, in, in, to our eyes and to our standards today, seems remarkably, to say, uh, casual, even domestic with these um, simple cloths uh, draping, uh, covering the, the stands. Uh, and as you also can see, the, the uh, relationship between drawings, photographs, and models um, forms a kind of convention that lasted for quite a while. Um, and that the drawing ambiance show breaks out of that convention quite strongly. Um, there's also times when a show, a cu the curation of drawings has, it's sort of like the cart and the horse has, has um, led to um, the development of important um, writing. And I'm thinking here of uh, Robert Evans's uh, architectural projection, which is an important piece of work, uh, but he, created it completely whole cloth out of the drawings in the exhibition at the CCA um, uh, at that time. So, um, so the show directly led to an important piece of architectural writing, which was completely based on the show. And the deconstructivist show, this is a little bit of like, say the rough history of architectural uh, exhibitions, but particularly I'm thinking about drawings um, and again, in the curatorial, um, the importance of the curatorial hand is that this show was, um, again, it was very selective. It was not didactic in terms of showing what was going on, but it was in a way created a, a uh, it was an attempt to create a narrative that declared a certain movement under underway um, and in a very reductive way. So in the end, the, the um the importance of narrative um the importance of a story the importance of tone characterization of what is going on around the the um the drawings is critical i think drawing ambiance was very aware of that the uh, when uh, nicola and nicholas uh devoted an enormous amount of energy to framing um that aspect and trying to draw in through old photographs um, through the the use of some furniture, through the framing of elements uh, to draw in the, so I say, the larger context that gave the drawings their, um, you know, basically gave the drawings a, a home. And as I said at the beginning, these these drawings are, in fact, quite out of their element uh, when they're taken out of the studio and out of the school. I, I'm probably running out of time. I don't know where we are, but uh, I'll try to wrap up here. So moving to a kind of the, uh, some current, uh, cons you could say, challenges of architectural drawing and uh, curation. Um, one is that uh, because of the digital, the development of the digital platforms for, for creating work, drawing has shifted uh, quite a bit. And the, the, the uh, drawing ambiance show is really a watershed because it marks the very end of uh, manual drawing. And so now we are in a world of far more, let's say far less um, production of manual work and, and an enormous production of digital work. So enormous that the role of curation is probably gonna be more a role of filtration and that uh, will become even more important paradoxically um, as, as, as images proliferate. Uh, the other point, point to make is that as architectural drawing shifts to the digital, it also has shifted far more to the image um, making and far less uh, about the, because say, tied to the mechanics of the production of buildings. And uh, that's just been a natural evolution. So this is a show here in, in, in New York, which I thought was a good to see again the the importance of context. If I would have done this at the drawing center, it would have lacked the architectural experience of walking through this building. This is the curator Brett Littman, and this was a show called Projection or Architectural Projection uh, in at the Austrian Cultural uh, Center in New York, which is a, quite an iconic building designed by Raymond Abraham. Yeah. So the show 
um, wanted to <laughs> have, a, it needed a home in order to make, make this work. Um, and this is just the current sense of things, which is that images, this is a show that was um, where the curators tried to, in a way, bring the drawings to some kind of anchor point. So the um, exhibit was limited um, to drawings that had to be deal with orthographic projection, had to deal with line work. In other words, the drawings had to stay within uh, traditional, some of the traditional aspects of architectural drawing. Uh, these are all digital projects. Uh, and so it's quite interesting because it's really a difficult question because the production of meaning has always been tied to the way in which things are made. And so now the digital platforms have in a way broken that, um, that con connection between making and meaning. And these are some more of those. So final two images, here we are in the, you could say, the, our new reality, which is that uh, on the left, you see an exhibition, which is all screens. So you wonder where is the role of curation and direct experience uh, if an exhibition is, um, I would say, um, transformed to the pure uh, uh, image, the pure digital image. And on the right, uh, this is a recent uh, piece from uh, Delors Cofidio's very well uh, regarded installation of uh, the Pierre Charot work at the Jewish Museum in New York, uh, where the use of drawing is become, has been in a way attempted to recover a didactic aspect of it. And this is a section that uh, is a virtual section through the glass house that moves back and forth and allows the public to understand the relationship between the section, the plan, which is, uh, you know, there's a laser projecting, showing you exactly where you are in the building. Um, so these are attempts to make, you could say, the digital relevant on the right. And on the left, I would say there we're facing, I would say, um, a curious moment uh, where we're wondering how the digital and the gallery um, uh, live together. Uh, that's it for me. I hope that wasn't too long. Actually, um, you, uh, you, you, did, you did a quite good job. You did it in 18 minutes. Uh, okay. According to my uh, watch, uh, wonderful okay. and, and 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 wonderful uh, points uh, about the uh, digital uh, tool that breaks up the making and meaning and 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 I am um, intrigued by the last two uh, last images. But we're gonna we're gonna come back. I I enjoy your talk. It's really um, pretty impressive and 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 everything. Um, I. I think uh, the next we should go to Oliver um, uh, to do the uh, to do the talk. Wait, yeah. I hope you can hear me now, and I hope you can see the presentation. Right. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. Chris, um, uh, at first, because I think we ha will have a lot of things to discuss afterwards. So what is the future of the digital? And what is the future of the exhibition? And um, yeah, and thank you so much for uh, for Sansan and uh, David for the for the nice opportunity to speak here and for the really um, nice introduction. And yeah, I want to start with um, one remark about my background. I was um, as David already mentioned, I was trained as an architect. So I'm an architect by education, never worked as an architect. And uh, afterwards, I worked as a writer and a critic before uh, becoming a curator in 2007. And I think this explains um, some aspects of my work because I'm always pretty much interested in uh, the design of the shows in the presentation modes or in the scenography. Um, I want to start with some pictures of the place where our museum, what our museum is and where it is located. Um, you, you see here the, uh, the museum itself. Um, it's a villa from uh, 1912, um, a historic building. That was the very first object of the museum. So the villa itself is here on display. It's put here on display and you see on the left side a model that this, this, that um, explains the concept by the architect Oswald Matthias Unger. So he um, 
he he wraps uh, one layer around the historic building and then uh, inserts inside the 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 villa um, at least two layers or um, in fact there are more um, of a new architecture and he was always referencing to those Russian dolls you see here um, the uh, Oliver, excuse me yeah. Oliver uh, your yeah. screen uh, froze at least uh, from my uh, screen, uh, your PowerPoint, your uh, presentation uh, did not move down to uh, to the to the museum itself. Ah, okay. Um, we didn't have can, any problem. Yeah. Yeah. Can can the, can the? I mean, I have it on the second screen. I see now what is what is actually online. I think it works. Uh, we you still can, have the first uh, title page. Oh no! Uh, ah. I I have the second slide. With the museum, the building. Oh, oh really? Uh, I, I, I do not. Um, sorry. Shan Shan, you have the yeah. second slide? On um, our side, it's okay. The oh, really? slide is very smoothly. Really? Oh, yeah. it's, then it's just me. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt you, Oliver. Sorry about no, that. No, no, no problem. No problem at all. And, and does anyone see now this, this cover of the modernist cuisine? The, the book cover in the middle? Yeah, I guess so. Yes. And yeah. the architect Congress? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, yeah, I move on. Um, yeah, so we thought about how to, how to um, explain this concept to our public. And that was the way, um, and that was the, the, um, the starting point where we made this, uh, the model image, which you see on the left side here. Um, that shows you this kind of onion structure of the museum itself. And um, you see the architect, Oswald Matthias Ungers, how he presented the building. It's always a bit like um, the picture reminds me a bit always of a magician uh, that is pulling a rabbit out of a, out of a hat um, in, a, in, a, in a stage performance. And we were referencing um, to this um, book cover, the modernist cuisine, where you see this sandwich um, here. Yeah. So um, the museum itself, um, as an exhibition space, is quite a challenge um, because it has almost no walls. Um, and the architect, Oswald Matthias Ungers, he, in a way, is not so much interested in making or allowing their exhibitions at all. Um, and the quote I have put here on the right side is from Ungers and he said it's here in purple just leave the whole building empty and buy yourself a shack next door where you can display all your stuff. Um, we have this auditorium um, somehow a bit a legendary auditorium because of the pretty uncomfortable chairs um, and I will come back to this auditorium situation later. But when you see the chairs, um, then you see that uh, Ungers not only made a special chair, which is hard to sit on, but he also uh, made a piece of architecture theory out of this simple chair. And this is the way he treated the whole building. So it's not only one chair, but it's a kind of morphological transformation um, of the chair into, um, uh, yeah, into other kinds of objects, which you see here. Um, put on a table in the auditorium. And here, the platonic house within the house, somehow the icon of the museum architecture itself. Um, in 2017, um, when Mark Lee and uh, Sharon Johnston were the curators of the Chicago Architecture Biennial, um, the uh, the historian and curator Sylvia Levin made a wonderful reference to our building because she rebuilt um, the core of our museum in Chicago in white foam and restaged um, an exhibition there uh, where she discussed issues of the presentation of architecture, um, which you see here in models. So it's a kind of restaging of an image uh, from the early days of our museum. And when we speak about the early days, we need to speak about Heinrich Klotz. Uh, he's the founder of the German Architecture Museum. He was an art historian, and he directed the dam between 1979 and 1989. Um, 
he was responsible to build up the collection. Um, the collection, I have some figures here on the left side, consists of about uh, 200,000 drawings, sketches and paintings, about 1,400 models. And in our library, we have about um, 30,000 books. Um, before I come to the uh, to three case uh, studies of exhibitions, I want to show you some of the highlights of the collection. And I wanted to show you this uh, drawing here, which was done by uh, Zoe Zengelis um, for Rem Kohlhaas for OMA, the city of the captive globe. Um, there are se several versions in the world in other collections as well. And we have one that was, uh, as you can read here on the left side, acquired from Rem Kohlhaas in 1982 for 5,000 German marks, which is about um, 5,000 US dollars. Um, why do I mention is, is this here is, it's a quite unusual attempt. Um, I would say it's a kind of self-reflection and a scientific self-reflection of the institution itself. Uh, we made a research project in 2014 to kind of uncover all the stories that lead to the collection. And we, as a public institution that we are, we also uncovered all the prices um, of the artworks that were bought for the collection. Um, Heinrich Klotz was kind of well connected to the architects of his times. Um, so he was able to buy this, uh, for instance, this sketchbook by Aldo Rossi or um, a fantastic drawing of a monument that Aldo Rossi did. Um, and this showing this drawing here is also kind of um, referring to the very first beginning of building up the institution, of building up the collection, because um, the director, he bought um, single pieces of beautiful drawings. Um, and that might be also a connection to, to the lecture of Chris. Um, because, I mean, what do these drawings tell us? What, what, what story do they really tell us? I mean, um, they were never, uh, for instance, in our case, they were never displayed close to the real project, which you see on the, on the bottom here. And so um, the museum itself shifted from this kind of single pieces, from the single beautiful artworks um, into another direction. And um, so um, whole estates of architects uh, came into the collection. And you see here Gottfried Böhm, who received the Pritzker Prize in 1986 uh, with his, um, I think, well, most well-known uh, work, The Navigus Church of um, 68. And um, this, this estate itself uh, contains about 30,000 drawings um, that you sometimes have to handle. Um, yeah, but um, just very quick, some kind of highlights from the collection. Um, architect and an archi archigram drawing and um, then you see here um, an important moment because the collection has strong connections to the US. Um, in 1973, uh, Heinrich Klotz, our founding director, he made a book with uh, interviews uh, with those architects. You can read their names here on the cover and so this is one way um, to establish a network and also to establish a network um, for pieces that came to the museum afterwards. Um, another way uh, to make a collection grow is to do um, travel exhibitions. Um, so our first show went to Japan um, where um, Akata Isotsaki was met and, um, and a drawing could be acquired. And um, Klotz also met um, Shin Takamatsu also to acquire um, a model and a series, a whole series of super beautiful drawings. Um, in 2014, we celebrated um, the 30th birthday of the museum and we decided to make an exhibition about all the stories, how the museum was founded, what was bought and for, for how much, I mean, uncovering all the prices and what has been the director's network. Um, the museum was opened with a show about postmodern architecture um, in 1984. And so we called our show 
um, that was taking place 30 years later, um, Mission Postmodern. And what we uh, did um, for the show, among other things, was to recreate the original context of some objects. Um, so we reenacted a part of the famous Strada Novissima of the first architecture biennial that went into our collection afterwards. Um, the main chapter of the show was a kind of uh, Wunderkammer, which is a chamber of curiosity in English. And we brought together um, one piece of every category um, of the collection. And so it was one model, one sketch, one in a collage, what sketch, one sketch in a collage, one sketch in black and white, one sketch in crayon. I mean, you can make this principle of um, bringing together one piece of each category, you can make this kind of endlessly almost. Um, and um, also this kind of uh, one poster, uh, one lithograph, one uh, oil painting, you see an oil painting by, uh, from the Zahara did on the top. And um, every ancient uh, Wunderkammer, every ancient chamber of curiosity has contained also some exotic animals. And so, um, for instance, large crocodiles mounted on the ceiling, hanging upside down. And we wanted the same, but of course, there were no animals or no crocodiles in our collection. And so we bought one um, made in plastic on Amazon. You could blow it up. And to justify this uh, choice, uh, this kind of uh, ironic reference to the old image of the Chamber of Curiosity, um, to justify this choice, we used a reference to a uh, crocodile installation done by the American architect Charles Moore that we do have in our collection. Um, and so I come to SOS Brutalism, um, a show that has monsters, but it did not have, um, so to say, real objects, um, but it has objects. Um, the show was part of a larger project and we wanted to find out if or how a museum can support or stimulate um, activist movements for the preservation of brutalist architecture. So we created an online database that is still supported. Um, and together with uh, students, um, a couple of large scale cardboard models were created. Um, you see here an image from the show and why was it cardboard? Well, um, to have some monsters in the geometric cage of the architecture, museum architecture of uh, Oswald Matthias Ungers, we considered that the bigger um, is the better. Um, here are some uh, triangular images, uh, triangular columns we created. And um, I flip to the next. Um, for the yeah that, that was the first um, that was the first uh, chapter um, of the show that where we created a number of concrete models, same height, different scales, and we call them the uh, zoo of concrete pets. Um, and here you see um, that we raised the question of female brutalist architects, and we searched and found them on rather unexpected places like. Pakistan, Iceland, Poland, and also in Taiwan. Um, this man, um, you should see in a second, um, is sitting in front of the only kind of real or historic objects in the show. It was a collection of postcards. And um, that collection of postcards leads to the conclusions that these monster buildings um, have been accepted as interesting new contributions to the cityscapes when they were finished. And so you have all these postcards where people write, okay, I am there and there and I discovered uh, kind of the new cityscape and I write you a postcard about it. Um, and um, on the wall uh, of the show, we wanted to, um, uh, which is here, we wanted to talk about a phenomenon that concrete has become increasingly popular during the last years. It's almost a wave of, so to say, concrete kitsch that you can encounter everywhere. And to deal with this phenomenon that um, concrete is 
kind of increasingly popular in popular culture. Um, we bought this perfume by Comme des Garçons and placed little paper stripes on top of the vitrine. And so every visitor could take this and, and bring this, uh, this kind of the taste of uh, this perfume, which is not the taste of concrete home. I hope you see here um, that the images are moving. Uh, I mean, they should, but now at the moment, they seem to be frozen. Ah, now I th see they are moving. Um, these GIFs are from the last venue of our exhibition. It was, of course, um, shown at the JUT Museum. And the fantastic team from Taipei took the idea of the monster building literally and made this kind of super cute um, animations. Uh, you see here an image um, of the show, and you see also um, the, the list of people who all belong to the fantastic team that made um, that venue in um, Taipei, made this possible. Um, students from six Taiwanese universities did an amazing job because we could not send our original concrete monsters, our cardboard monsters, we couldn't send them to Taipei. It's kind of, the, 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 the crates would have been far too large. And so um, students from six Taiwanese universities, they recreated um, the whole show and built the monster buildings the second time, as uh, you see here, um, the Boston City Hall. And um, as it happens in every venue of SRS brutalism, there is a connection to a local community of scholars and preservation activists. Um, in Taiwan, we had a close collaboration with Professor Wang, who was the co-curator of the show. And um, so six buildings from Taiwan could be added to the show. And uh, one of those, one of the, my absolute favorites uh, worldwide is the so-called wave tower, a truly unique school architecture that has waving floors because that provides a better sight for the children in the classrooms. So I come to the, to the last case as a super brief, um, as a super brief um, example of the most recent show I did, um, picture should come in a second, um, it was about Gottfried Böhm, already mentioned. Um, he turned 100 years old, being still alive, when we opened the show. Um, so that's the reason why um, the name of the show is Böhm 100. So he became, he turned 100. And this show was partly dealing with original drawings. Um, and he made fantastic uh, cold drawings. But it consists also of photography and patterns of his masterpiece, the Church of Nevigas. Um, and so our graphic designers, Ralvis Pietz, they propose to meld or collage large photos into, it, into each other. And we had the original pieces um, from our collection hanging on the walls right in front of these, um, in, front of these uh, in front of these large images. You can see here. Um, I, strongly suggest that each exhibition should reflect itself and should even include a chapter of criticism maybe. I mean, we did it and uh, it worked out quite well, I would say. Um, a chapter of criticism on its own subject. Um, and here you see we had some critical voices about the monumental and dominant appearance of this, what was called, called once a mountain of concrete. And uh, the architect, an architect, uh, his name is Wolfgang Döring, you can see the book cover on the right side, who advocated for a light and kind of high-tech architecture. And he even compared in his book, uh, Perspektiven einer Architektur, on the right side, um, the architecture of Böhm with the uh, fortification of the Nazi regime. And so he asked the question, aren't we, uh, shouldn't we build in a new way after so many decades? Um, is it still is it still um, the the right gesture to make this kind of monumental approach towards architecture? Um, the so to say the main piece of the show um, was dealing with uh, what you have already seen the auditorium because we used 
the show took place around the auditorium you see now. Um, and we used the auditorium to kind of transform the whole space into um, the impression of a Böhm architecture. So we put um, which wallpapers, large uh, wallpapers on the wall, and we kind of um, had this gesture that Gottfried Böhm's architecture swallows the architecture of Oswald Michiels Ungers and transformed this um, exhibition space or the auditorium space in some something completely different. And with that image, I think I'm uh, quite a bit over time. Um, yeah, thank you. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Yeah. Um, actually, everybody is doing quite great in terms of uh, time control, Oliver. And uh, so we now go to Eric. Um, OK. Great. Uh, and I'm going to try to do well with time control also, but I, I, I think I might fail. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. So thank you um, uh, again, uh, uh, Shan Shan, uh, David, and JUT for, for having all of us. And, and, uh, and also thank you, uh, Chris and Oliver, for those great presentations. Um, I am going to uh, open mine now. Let's see if it works. And... Um, and as this is sort of, um, uh, I'll assume this is working unless I hear otherwise. Um, I am going to sort of, uh, as we're sort of talking about architecture and architecture collections uh, with an institutional context, I thought I would just sort of um, uh, give a brief overview of, of two of my, uh, uh, well, current and previous um, uh, roles um, uh, at, at two different institutions, uh, one of which was building uh, a new collection, uh, the other, uh, uh, my more recent, uh, my, my, my current role uh, at the new institute uh, in Rotterdam, uh, or already having a collection, but I can talk a little bit about what we are trying to do uh, with that collection. So uh, I call my talk Building on an Architecture Collection. So again, it's both about building uh, the collection and building on, uh, well, building a new collection and building on an, an existing one. So I'll start with M Plus, uh, which uh, just opened finally uh, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, it's a new uh, museum of visual culture, visual culture being a kind of umbrella term for uh, art, uh, design and architecture, which was the area that I uh, oversaw uh, curatorially and uh, moving image. And uh, it's a, a fairly big building, about uh, I think 65,000 square meters uh, designed by Herzog and de Muron uh, on this really amazing location right on Victoria Harbor uh, in Hong Kong with a bit of concrete and, uh, and brutalist, uh, uh, some concrete and uh, brutalist moments uh, uh, as well. Now, uh, the area that I uh, was working on was, uh, again, architecture and design. And, and within that, you know, we had the whole sort of range of disciplines. This is a very sort of simplistic, um, a very simplistic use of categories here. It, it was, of course, much more complex than that. But um, uh, but you got the idea. It was architecture, urbanism, uh, design through furniture and uh, industrial design, graphics. We had some fashion and then more kind of speculative and uh, conceptual practices uh, drawn from uh, uh, more sort of recent um, uh, well, from, uh, from more, more, more recent times. Uh, and, but I'll talk about the architect. I'll focus on the architecture. Uh, and here are just a few images of the galleries uh, displaying some of the uh, collection that we managed to build. I started um, in 2012 uh, as, uh, would, as uh, um, sort of being among the first uh, crop of curators hired by the museum. Uh, I was there from 2012 to 2018. And uh, it was during that period that the bulk of the collection uh, was uh, was assembled, all sort of leading up to this uh, kind of moment uh, two weeks ago for the opening. Uh, of course, not just for the opening, but uh, but over time, the, the the collection is much bigger than what what was um, what was shown, as with all museums. Uh, but here is just to give you a uh, a sense. But I'm I'm going to focus less on the display of the collection uh, than on the sort of approach to building it, because um, what we were trying to do was to uh, recenter narratives. So the museum is uh, it's, it's it's global in scope, uh, but sort of uh, its 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 aim was to sort of look uh, to to sort of tell, uh, and in many cases, uh, in some cases, actually help construct um, the narratives of, of visual culture you know, within 
our region, let's say vaguely defined as Asia, which of course I know is a, a, a problematic term, but let's just um, uh, please just just, just bear, with, uh, bear with us for now, um, while also uh, revisiting well-known global narratives from our vantage point in the region. So it's, uh, we are, we were not, or M plus is not, I should say, um, a museum of Asian visual culture, but rather a museum of visual culture, uh, uh, globally speaking, uh, as seen from uh, different Asian perspectives. And, and that's a very uh, important distinction to make. It wasn't about sort of defining uh, what is Asian design or what is Asian uh, architecture, but rather uh, placing it uh, within uh, broader transnational uh, and global networks of ideas and, and, and so on. So, you know, uh, this is a very simple example here. You would have uh, the Hong Kong art the, the Hong Kong architect Jackson Wong uh, from around 1954 doing uh, these sort of courtyard studies, sort of drawing from, uh, of course, the, the traditional Chinese typology of the courtyard, as well as Wang Dahong, uh, who I'm sure uh, the entire audience knows is sort of the father of, 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 modern, uh, of, of modern architecture in, in Taiwan, who is looking at some of the issues. Um, they were looking at from their vantage point, but within, again, a global context in which they also were looking at uh, uh, Mies van der Rohe and his uh, very well-known uh, studies of, 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 court, uh, of the courtyard typology from the 1930s uh, as well. So this is uh, just one, one example of sort of how we were approaching these kind of uh, uh, this recentering uh, exercise. But but for us, you know, Wong Jackson Wong and Wang Da Hong were at the center of our narratives. With you know Mies there, of course, but really providing more uh, context or um, a, a little bit more in the background rather than the foreground. Uh, different other sort of narratives that we could create, uh, of course, the, these are just three examples, you know, the difference of the emergence of different post-war modernisms in Asia through people like Wang Da Hong or in Japan, uh, Kikutake, uh, architecture as, a, uh, as an instrument of post-colonial nation building, uh, whether in Singapore, Malaysia, India, etc. And then, of course, uh, tropical or, or also Cambodia. Uh, these, 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 these narratives are all overlapping. Uh, 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 so that Van Molly Van, uh, you know, was was um, was very much part of the uh, post-independence uh, kind of um, uh, agenda in, in Cambodia with his uh, amazing projects throughout, especially the the capital, but also um, uh, the emergence of of uh, different strains of tropical modernism through his work, uh, as well as Jeffrey Bawa uh, in in Sri Lanka. Uh, we, of course, collected you know the sort of. Uh, you know, it, it was it was interesting because in some ways this was an instant collection, right? We were sort of collecting the past, let's say, eighty uh, or sixty to hundred years, um, uh, and and sort of uh, collecting using approaches that were appropriate to the time. So we were, you know, the, your sort of typical drawings and models and 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 and, and so on and so forth. Like, uh, um, the, the, the different modes of representation and mediation uh, and ways of showing process that are uh, the kind of more uh, or orthodox ways of, of collecting. Uh, but at the same time, we were collecting actual spaces. Um, this is the uh, Kiyotomo Sushi Bar uh, from Tokyo. Uh, it was opened in 1988, uh, designed by uh, Shiro Kuramata, uh, in the, uh, who's better known for his uh, furniture designs, but in fact, uh, at the time was just as known for his interiors. Uh, throughout the 80s, he designed, I think, uh, almost 400 uh, interiors in Japan, but also throughout the world um, for Issei Miyake, uh, Esprit, and, 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 and uh, you know, really very much part of that kind of 80s uh, a cultural zeitgeist. Um, and this was, uh, uh, in again, in Shinbashi. Uh, it's a, it's a, one of the very few interiors by Kremata that uh, was uh, left. Uh, I think only about three or four when we uh, came upon this uh, were still existing uh, because, of course, these commercial uh, interiors are, 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 are you know, uh, they tend not to last very long as, as businesses change and, 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 and remodel and so forth. Um, but this managed to survive. Uh, it had been lying dormant actually for for ten years. Uh, it had been empty. Um, the uh, the original owner had run into some financial problems and just totally uh, disappeared. Uh, the lease was taken over by Richard Schlagman, uh, the former owner of Fiden, the book publisher. Um, he had hoped to reopen it uh, as a restaurant. He's a big Kormata fan. Uh, but uh, those plans never panned out, so it had been empty, and he was right about to sort of auction off the contents and 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 
and uh, uh, and give up the lease uh, when uh, we were able to acquire it and uh, we uh, dismantled it. Uh, amazingly enough, uh, the the firm that 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 actually constructed uh, the original interior is still around, and, and two of the workers who actually worked on building uh, Kiyotomo uh, in 1988 were uh, were also still working for that firm uh, uh, called Ishimaru, and uh, those guys were uh, involved in uh, deinstalling it uh, in Tokyo and then reinstalling it. Uh, in the galleries at M plus, uh, where you can see it now uh, in the image on the right. Um, we also collected archives, and you know, archigram uh, already came up um, uh, briefly in Oliver's um, uh, presentation, uh, and this is also very relevant to uh, Alvin Boyarsky because. Uh, Archogram was a uh, loose uh, collective of, of five architects uh, in London in the 1960s and, and early 70s, very closely associated with the Architectural Association. Uh, in fact, um, uh, one of them, uh, David Green, uh, is still one of the members, David Green, still teaches there. Uh, but they were, um, you know, one of the kind of quintessential, let's say, paper uh, architects in that they uh, didn't really build anything. Um, uh, but rather what they were doing through their drawings, or and actually through their drawings, which were mostly for publication, uh, was uh, enacting a kind of critique of the uh, of the sort of static form formality of 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 of, of modernism and, and, and arguing um, for a new type of architecture that was um, just as sort of uh, dynamic, uh, uh, interchangeable, expendable, um, uh, and um, uh, and, um, uh, and and flexible as the times uh, that, uh, that 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 they were living in a time of you know the sort of jet age, a uh, time of sort of mass cons uh, um, burgeoning mass consumption, uh, and 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 uh, and and um, uh, uh, in, in, in which the the mediated image was 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 playing a more and more uh, important role uh, in uh, in visual culture. So we um, managed to, oh, sorry, we managed to acquire uh, uh, the entire archive uh, from the surviving members. Now, of course, some of the drawings had already been given to other uh, institutions over the years, uh, including DAM. Um, and uh, I believe there are uh, quite, a, quite a few, uh, or there are a number in the Boyarsky uh, collection. I don't know if they're up in the show uh, in, in, in Taipei. Um, but we uh, acquired the uh, the bulk, uh, which includes about three to four thousand uh, drawings, and then uh, hundreds of photographs and slides and and uh, uh, video recordings, and even some of the uh, the equipment that they use, both drawing tools um, and also audiovisual equipment, uh, which they which was a, a really important part of uh, their practice and their form uh, and, and their modes of talking about architecture and their work, and. It was uh, uh, a, a real, you know, uh, a, a really great acquisition for us. Um, and I guess the, the the question that many people ask was sort of why. And uh, it, for us, it was really useful and really important to actually bring this uh, this archive, which is so uh, was so influential globally, uh, to Hong Kong, um, not only as a way of giving. Uh, the archive a new context and a new way and perhaps new perspectives on looking at the at the archogram archive but also uh, as in providing a lens for looking at hong kong because um you know in many ways hong kong is uh, not by design or not by intention uh, but so almost by accident, um, Hong Kong is perhaps, you know, you could argue the ultimate uh, archigram city, you know, with its sort of uh, elaborate uh, networks of, 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 of mega structures, its sort of constant, uh, its sort of constant state of flux, it's a city of flying escalators and, and media facades where uh, the entire city, uh, the entire urban landscape is really like a, a mediated um, a space, it's a place of pop-up entertainments, uh, uh, in which in which culture sort of appears in um, in, in very eph ephemeral ways, only to disappear later. Um, it's uh, these sort of instant cities, you know, these uh, that 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 kind of appear um, uh, uh, throughout uh, Hong Kong. And so, for us, uh, it was not only great to have the archive because the archive is amazing, uh, but also uh, as a way of again 
creating a lens or a theoretical or conceptual um, and even visual uh, new framework uh, by which we can by which uh, we can start to th think and think about and 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 uh, and, and, and and rethink um, the the urban forms uh, typologies and qualities uh, of of Hong Kong. Um, one more project from M Plus that I'll uh, briefly mention because. Uh, uh, you know, uh, architecture is more than just buildings and you know, and bricks and concrete and glass and steel, uh, as 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 we know, you know, through uh, through uh, much through uh, uh, you know the explorations of many of the architects who are who are in the Boyarsky um, uh, collection. Uh, we also in you know as a museum in Hong Kong uh, and, and and a museum of visual culture in Hong Kong. Um, uh, we almost by accident undertook a, a, a sort of project looking at, uh, at neon signs, and it was prompted by um, an article that one of my colleagues spotted in, in, in one of the local newspapers. I think it was 2016, if I'm not mistaken. No, 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 sorry, it was, it was before that, 2013. Um, and it concerned this giant uh, neon cow uh, that had hung over uh, Queens Road Central uh, in uh, the Saing Pun uh, district of Hong Kong since 1978. Now the government was forcing it to come down uh, as a sort of safety hazard, despite the fact that it had been hanging there uh, for what was it, um, uh, uh, 40 years, uh, 45 years without incident. And it immediately uh, occurred to us that we should be collecting this uh, sign. If, if, if it's coming down, it should be part of our, our collection. Now, uh, this was a very uh, visceral uh, reaction, and and having had that reaction uh, or, or, or response, we wanted to sort of explore it a little bit more. So, um, uh, the 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 context. Uh, of course, is Hong Kong uh, is known has long been known for its neon signs. Um, uh, it's it's uh, the image of, of neon signs is really sort of indelible uh, to the image of Hong Kong and the sort of collective uh, imagination, as you can see in this image of Nathan Road in 1960. But uh, by the time we worked on this project in uh, 2014. Uh, m the signs were quickly uh, disappearing. So you can sort of see uh, the, the sort of before and after of the same stretch of uh, Nathan Road from 1960 to, uh, to 2014. So these were all disappearing you know, very quickly. And so we launched um, a our first online exhibition called neonsigns.hk. Uh, it's still up uh, if you want to uh, have a look. But uh, basically, this was a way of examining uh, neon signs um, through multiple uh, uh, frameworks and, and 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 from multiple angles. Uh, we uh, through uh, and also playing with uh, different possibilities in in the online uh, format. So we had, you know, videos and slideshows and essays and kind of um, uh, uh, so on and so forth, looking at, uh, for example, uh, neon signs as a uh, as a marriage of craft and 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 industry. So like this 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 video of of, of how neon signs are are, are actually made. It's a, it's it's a fascinating process. Um, neon signs as a cinematic device. Hong Kong, you know, um, is is also famous for its or has been famous for its film industry. So we had like interviews with Christopher Doyle, who was um, for a long time, uh, Wang Kar Wai's um, uh, uh, main cinematographer, uh, uh, talking about uh, the sort of presence uh, and use of, of neon in Wang Kar Wai's uh, films. Uh, we were able to acquire a whole bunch of, uh, I think, two or three hundred uh, neon uh, sketches, neon sign sketches that really kind of illustrate that. Uh, uh, how these uh, signs really do emerge from a design process and conscious choices, um, even extending to the types of calligraphy uh, that are used and 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 how those are um, uh, how, how those are uh, uh, chosen for for different contexts and different types of of of, of businesses. Uh, we commission new projects. Uh, here's a series of photographer, a, a series of photographs, or one of a series of photographs by the photographer Wing Sha, who also worked with Wang Kar Wai, where he photographed people who live uh, behind, in front of, uh, and underneath um, uh, neon signs uh, in, in Hong Kong. Uh, lots of activities, including workshops for children, but also for the blind and neon bus tours. Um, and then Really, uh, what one a really important part of this project was creating an online neon archive. So we had decided that we were going to, having decided that we were going to start collecting neon signs, 
uh, we needed to get a better sense of uh, what neon signs still existed because as i mentioned uh, they had been uh, disappearing very very quickly uh, from the urban landscape in hong kong so um you know we have uh, we we didn't have the sort of resources to be going out and 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 and, and doing all the research uh, on our own uh, covering every uh, street and, and and alleyway of hong kong so what, what we did was we decided to ask the public for help so we created um, a crowdsourcing uh, initiative where we asked members of the public to uh, take photos of the neon signs around them, uh, tell us their location, and send them into us. And then we uh, pin those on a map uh, to create a neon map of Hong Kong that also uh, served and continues to serve as an archive of the neon signs that remained uh, in uh, the city, at least as of uh, 2014. So uh, that was, uh, I hope this sort of gives some sense of, of the different kinds of uh, approaches we were taking to architecture and collecting architecture um, uh, at M+. And then I'll sort of move now to my current role, uh, which is as general and artistic director of uh, Het Nuve Institute, or the new institute, uh, which is in Rotterdam. Uh, now, uh, the new institute, uh, it's a young uh, it's museum uh, with a much longer history, in fact. Um, it was formed only eight years ago, but it was formed from the merger of three existing institutes, uh, the, Nether the Netherlands Architecture Institute, uh, the Premsela uh, Institute for Design, and also the virtual platform uh, uh, for e-culture. Uh, and so hence we've become now the sort of national, the Dutch National uh, Museum and Institute for Architecture, Design, and uh, Digital Culture. But I will focus on just the architecture part um, right now. Uh, and I'll just tell you a little bit about what we uh, do. Um, uh, for starters, we are uh, the commissioner of the uh, Dutch Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale. Uh, and here you just see uh, one image of, of, the, uh, of, of this year's Dutch Pavilion uh, in Venice, which I just closed, I believe, uh, just a few days ago, uh, called Who Is We? Uh, I, 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 I won't get into it in too much detail uh, for, uh, in, in the interest of time. Um, but we also uh, have our own building uh, that's kind of uh, in the collection, I guess you could say, but also another house uh, adjacent to our building that we uh, operate and manage. We, we don't actually own it, but we, um, but we sort of, uh, we, we, uh, yeah, we, we operate it. Uh, and that is the Sonneveld House, uh, designed in 1933 by uh, the firm of Brinkman and uh, van der Flucht. And it is um, a really amazing example of uh, Dutch uh, functionalism, uh, Dutch functionalist architecture. And uh, here's just one image. Uh, here's, here's the interior. And we do do uh, quite a number of also artists and other interventions uh, from time to time within the house. Uh, we have performances. Um, one project that we're working on now, which I think will be really amazing, is that we're, uh, we're, we're hoping uh, to collaborate with uh, some researchers who work on uh, the architecture as seen through the seeing impaired, or as seen through the eyes of the seeing impaired. So, like people with uh, who, with, with blindness or, or various degrees of blindness, uh, to develop an installation that would allow you to sort of see the house without seeing it, uh, using other senses, of course. Uh, but we also uh, hold the collection, which is um, what I'll probably focus on. Uh, the Dutch National Collection of Architecture and uh, Urban Planning. And it's a collection that um, dates back uh, about 100 years. In fact, I think next year is the 100th anniversary of the collection, which is sort of passed through different hands and, um, uh, and evolved uh, uh, over the years. But, at the mo but currently, uh, it's, it's big. Uh, I'm, I, I keep being uh, told that apparently we're the it's the largest uh, architecture collection uh, in an institution uh, uh, in the world um, that uh, includes 18 kilometers of archival material, uh, over 700 archives, uh, and uh, and over four million uh, objects uh, and documents, including models, drawings, photographs, uh, etc. Uh, a re we continue to build on it. Uh, a recent acquisition, which was, you know, kind of amazing, is uh, earlier this year we were able to acquire the only uh, surviving model uh, left uh, uh, by uh, Theo van Doesburg, or Theo van Doesburg, as we would say in the Netherlands, the the, uh, the, the really um, uh, influential member of the De Stijl movement. Um, 
This is for a, a cafe that he designed in Strasbourg uh, in the 1920s, and it's really fascinating because you know he worked mostly uh, in, in, in drawings. Um, and this model is actually a drawing that folds, uh, uh, and, and it really uh, lends um, further kind of insights into the interior, which it was which was in many ways a, a three-dimensional extrapolation uh, of, of 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 his drawings. <clears throat> Uh, but having you know having this amazing collection, uh, we also acknowledge that the collection was, uh, you know, uh, has been a product of its time and place. Uh, its time and place uh, being uh, coming with a long history of, of course, um, uh, uh, collecting and telling narratives from uh, from a dominant uh, perspective, what we now uh, consider a the uh, a canonical perspective, which was of course largely you know white 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 and male um uh I, I think we're all aware uh that one of the sort of very important discussions going on right now throughout the cultural fields is, is how to kind of uh decolonize uh collections uh and and museological approaches to collections uh to be more inclusive and diversive and also to uh to give voice to other narratives uh, that did not have voice before and of course this also relates to the work we were doing uh, at, at m plus because um, you know, when you look at the sort of, um, uh, if, if you look at the various fields that we were uh, collecting, uh, you know, uh, uh, design, architecture, art, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, those global discourses have been dominated by, uh, you know, the sort of Euro-American sphere. Um, now, that's not because there was nothing happening uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, it's largely due to the fact that there haven't been the institutional voices uh, telling those stories. And, and, and that's very much one of the things that M plus was um, is, is meant to do, is to provide um, uh, one of those voices. But within uh, uh, the New Institute's collection, of course, we also re recognize our own history and its biases. And so we have a, uh, an initiative called Collecting Otherwise. Um, uh, for in which a lot of research and thinking uh, has been gone uh, into uh, making what was invisible uh, visible uh, through the lens of sort of fe uh, feminist uh, stories, queer stories, um, decolonized uh, narratives. Um, uh, here is uh, an example of, of, of a feminist archive that we just acquired. We also acquired um, uh, an archive around squatting and the notion of of, uh, of of the informal use of architecture and architecture as a social space. Again, rather than uh, more than uh, the sort of uh, canonical kind of uh, views uh, that that have been uh, uh, predominant. Again, sort of um, trying to sort of decolonize. I mean, the Netherlands is um, sort of just now uh, kind of beginning to to to, to seriously grapple with its own, with its own colonial. Uh, history, uh, especially uh, in, in Suriname, uh, Indonesia, the Caribbean, uh, and so on. Uh, again, here's some uh, an archive relating to uh, the queer spaces that that, that we recently uh, acquired. Um, and moreover, though, we are trying to develop tools uh, that really uh, help can help form a strategy for uh, um, uh, for for rethinking our existing collection, but also rethinking how we continue to collect uh, in the future. And just one example of these tools is something that my colleagues have developed, which is called the asterisk. And um, I'll just, uh, it's, it's basically a way of, of, of annotation, uh, of, of annotating the, uh, the, uh, the information that we have, uh, the research that we have, uh, in order to kind of, uh, in, uh, in a, um, uh, uh, you know, because we're we're not able to sort of rewrite everything uh, all at once, and also it's uh, while acknowledging that narratives are constantly changing, the asterisk the asterisk allows us to um, uh, insert uh, in in a very sort of um, uh, uh, transparent way uh, the I and make really transparent the fact that. Um, these uh, materials in our collection were collected under cer certain assumptions, and then those, and that those assumptions are uh, are, are are now changing. Uh, another uh, initiative, a very big one, uh, is called Disclosing Architecture, uh, and this is our digitization uh, effort. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a uh, a big collection, four million uh, objects and 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 and, uh, and documents. Um, we were given a grant by the Dutch Ministry of Culture of uh, I think eleven million euros a, a couple of years a couple of years ago to undertake this six year program um, to. 
uh, I'm sorry, there's a mis there is, there's a misspelling here, uh, but to restore um, and conserve and digitize uh, a, a large part of our collection. Uh, this includes uh, about 1.4 million uh, of the 4 million uh, objects uh, that we have with an initial focus on design drawings, our photos, and our Theo van Duisburg uh, collection uh, in stage one. And then stage two, which we're just sort of starting to kind of um, uh, uh, develop a little bit more thoroughly uh, is to is to make that uh, digitized collection more more accessible both uh, online uh, through a better search portal um, also uh, in, uh, in 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 its analog form uh, in our new study center which we've just renovated um, and then also how to network our digital collection with other um, dig digital collections while um, uh, while making them more sort of uh, resilient uh, for in the long term. Uh, so we've begun uh, this project. I think we've had several hundred thousand uh, works have been uh, digitized already, um, and that's uh, uh, and it will uh, uh, it will continue again through 2024. Uh, and uh, and uh, concurrently, though, uh, um, as as we, I mean, what's what's sort of amazing is that we we do a lot of things at 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 the new institute, but somehow they all kind of link up. So our own digitization effort is uh, will uh, eventually link up to another effort that we have uh, been actually assigned uh, by uh, the Dutch uh, Ministry of Culture, which is to develop a network for archives of design and digital culture. So our collection uh, is again the National Architecture Collection. Uh, in the in the Netherlands, there is no national collection for design or digital culture, uh, and so this has become a, a kind of issue. Uh, and the question as, as 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 to how to rectify that situation. Now, I think we're at a point in which we um, uh, no longer need to think of archives and collections as being so necessarily centralized, right? Like in some ways, it doesn't make sense in terms of the resources involved, uh, and also the way in which uh, we the in the, the way in which we are uh, as a culture hoping to sort of um, uh, dis disseminate and make. Uh, make uh, collections accessible, it doesn't make sense now to, to, to suddenly invest God knows how much um, in building like a new uh, a new uh, design and digital culture uh, uh, archive, when in fact these archives already exist in many cases, but just in, uh, in, dis in distributed form. So uh, we have been uh, assigned to kind of lead a uh, an effort to develop a framework and policy for establishing a network of these archives uh, that brings together uh, the archives of different institutions while also in the longer term um, determining how ex existing archives that do not have permanent homes uh, might find permanent homes. So how we sort of share uh, the sort of national, let's say, patrimony of design and digital culture. Uh, at the moment, we have about 40 partners working on this, and this is a um, <clears throat> an effort that is uh, I think going on for about one more year, after which we should have a kind of a framework and policy for, for seeing how we take things uh, to the next step in terms of imp implementation. And I'll just end my presentation, I'm sure, oh gosh, I'm, I think I'm really uh, taking too long now, um, uh, just with an example of an exhibition that we just opened a few weeks ago, MBRDV, HNI. Um, MBRDV is the sort of well-known Dutch architecture firm. Uh, we hold the first 400 projects of its archive. And um, we just did a show uh, because they just opened this incredible depot building uh, right, right next to us. So as part of that, we decided to show the archives. So we have um, the models and, and oral histories and, and drawings and so on and so forth, as you can see. But what's interesting about this archive is that it's, it, it's in fact mostly a born digital archive. And this has been brought up uh, already. So uh, we've begun sort of figuring out what to do with that digital uh, material, um, not only in terms of conservation, but also in terms of um, knowledge production. So part of this, this exhibition includes uh, six ar digital archival tools that we commissioned uh, as many practitioners to come up with. And these are really kind of um, uh, amazing because with a digital archive, you are a born digital archive, there's, it's, it suddenly opens up all sorts of opportunities to how you can actually use it. So we have one tool uh, that uh, searches through all the emails of uh, MBRDV and then and, and then plots the sort of frequency of use of certain terms over time. Uh, and that gives you really uh, interesting insights into the different priorities and, and changing practices of that firm itself. Another tool um, uh, allows you to, uh, through virtual reality, uh, 
or sorry, uh, uh, through virtual reality goggles, you can. Uh, it, it, we, we were able to recreate a lot of their uh, uh, multimedia installations that that MVR UV uh, produced uh, over the years. And then this one, which I'm showing you an image of now, which is really kind of fun, is uh, Alex uh, Alice Bucknell. Uh, she uh, kind of retrieved uh, all the digital files for quite a number of uh, MVR UV urban projects and created, a and created a speculative video game in which in a post-apocalyptic scenario, uh, the only thing that's left of uh, our global architectural patrimony is the MVRDV digital archive on a server. And she created uh, essentially this, this video game in which you can navigate a world rebuilt only using uh, MVRDV's plans. So again, sorry for taking too long and uh, I'll end it there. Well, thank you, Eric. Is the game available via your uh, website? Uh, not on the website yet, but uh, <laughs> but, but we'll 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 uh, yeah we'll we'll look at that. I I I I am looking forward to it. Wonderful, wonderful talk. And I think uh, what uh, Chris has started, Art, Eric, in a way, uh, uh, in a way, uh, responded uh, in in uh, in in what he's doing now, but. Um, I, uh, well, our time is uh, for us uh, uh, 15 minutes to our uh, scheduled uh, time. But since uh, we uh, were held up by technical uh, issues for uh, 15 minutes, so we have about 30 minutes uh, to discuss. And um, I would say that I already received uh, a couple of questions, um, but uh, before uh, I uh, throw these uh, uh, questions to you. I would like to encourage, um, you know, um, to have some cross uh, exchange uh, uh, between you, um, our uh, keynote speakers, if any. Well, I have a question for Oliver. Um, with your SOS Brutalism show, which which looks amazing, and I'm so sad I I I, I wasn't able to, um, uh, to 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 see either iterations. I I remember when you um, did uh, when when you when you first applied for the M Plus Design Trust Fellowship, which which you wound up getting. Um, I you 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 had a, a really fascinating proposition, which was looking at brutalism in East Asia as the sort of uh, regional variation or regional expression of postmodernism, and 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 I was just sort of curious what, uh, uh, where, how that, uh, how that research went, or yeah. Yeah. Um, no. Thanks for the for the for the for the um, special question in that direction. Um, well, yes, I'm. Um, but but basically, the challenge is in a way uh, what we consider to be brutalism or not. And so, I mean, I was super happy um, that at the show at the JUT uh, Museum in, in in Taipei, we could include this uh, Kaohsiung Cultural Building, uh, which is basically a large pagoda, and it it also had this kind of notions of 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 an of an almost nationalist attitude. I mean, it's not the the, the, I mean, it, it has also this kind of problematic sides, I would say. And I'd say, I would say that's it's, it's a fantastic um, example how the, 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 the brutalist attitude turned into some, some strong relation to history. And I would say this is a fantastic um, example we could show. It's, a, it's a, a concrete building. It has this kind of rhetoric we were always referring to. And it and it is in um, in Taipei, and it has a kind of strong connection to postmodern ideas. And yes, um, I think there's a strong. I, I would always say that. I mean, in the in the in the um, historiography, um, brutalism is 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 in many cases considered as a kind of dead end of modernism. And I would say no, it's not. It's it's a kind of bridge. Um, and our, I mean, one of my favorite examples for this is the. Uh, and we had it in the show it, it, as a large model is the Boston City Hall. I mean, the Boston City Hall is a temple. <laughs> it's a kind of super academic exercise. I mean, uh, it's and, it, and it's it's so much about history and it's about bringing back um, a palazzo, an almost uh, Florentine Italy uh, palazzo in in the middle of Boston. Um, and it's not a dead end. It's it's kind of this kind of longing for um, things that are going really really uh, uh backwards and and so yeah it's it's a, it's a strong it's a strong issue for me yeah 
Well, <laughs> talking about Boston, Chris probably want to say something about Boston City Hall, or maybe. Well, um, as a as a little footnote, which is so interesting,、uh, my partner Kina Lesky, her father was、um, uh, Wallace K. Harrison's chief architect,、wow. and、uh, when he was in Harrison's office,、um, he did Albany, the Albany.、Um, Government Center, the building that looks vaguely similar.、Um, they're all, in a way, referring referencing La Tourette. But a young、yeah. architect approached him in the office and said, "Do you want to do this competition with me for Boston City Hall?" And Tad Lesky said, "No, I'm I'm too busy." And so Gerhard、uh, Kalman <laughs> went and found somebody else. <laughs>、uh, so the rest is history. Yeah.、Um, and but I would add one note because it's very current: is that people. This is a part of why curation is so important because people have a very, I would say, a kind of caricature view of brutalism. And、uh, in Providence, here we lost our most important brutalist building, demol demolition,、um, abandoned, hated, as seen as an eyesore. But the the program of the building was a public employment office.、Mm. It was it was a social program. That in the in the in an that came out of an era of you could say where this at least in this country there was an era of enlightened government aid to I would say the lower classes the unemployed the the down and out and so it was a it had a very public plaza so the you could say the social virtue of it was completely forgotten because all people saw was a, a brutalist eyesore so it's 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 incredibly important that nuances always. In a way, brought forward. Yeah. Well,、um, same thing with、uh, in Boston, uh, uh, Paul Rudolph's uh, 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 Civic uh, Service Center, something like that.、Um, you know,、um, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But but let me just ask something. I enjoy SOS brutalism、um, uh, so much in one、uh, in a dimension that uh, 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 Oliver just brought up. Uh, it, it's truly、really、a monster in the in the sense that it transformed and and changes shapes as it goes around the world, and it, it does、uh, it does、uh, have a multiple、uh, dimension that that one can explore, and that's so that's what's so wonderful about Oliver's uh, 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 exhibition. I mean, in South Africa,、uh, in South in, in South America, in Africa, in in Russia. You see all these、uh, morphing, uh, uh, changed monster, and it's pretty amazing. And 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 it definitely has a multi-dimension that's there. And and that's why um, um, Oliver said that uh, you know uh, by curation、uh, we can actually try to activate a movement. Uh, uh, and I totally agree with that. Not just started a movement, just uh, like uh, the international style or the constructivist architecture, but 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 a movement that 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 brought a multi dimension、uh, back to something that was ignored or、um, was not realized at one point. Eric, I I I wish you have a chance、uh, to visit, and、uh, if it, it comes on at at some times, it's a wonderful.、Uh, yeah. But um,、uh, anything else uh, that uh, you would like to exchange uh, among uh, three of you? Do you have any archogram drawings in the Boyarsky show?、Just、oh yeah. Sort of oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah.、Right. Oh yeah. Yeah.、Um, we do have a couple of、uh, what he called, I think,、uh, by the category of、uh, European、uh, avant-garde. Yeah. Chris, right? Yeah. The radical European radical. I re. Yeah. European radicals. We have David Green. We have.、Uh, yeah. yeah. All, all, all those. Yep. Yep. Okay.、Um, anything else? Okay. I.、Uh, I would.、Uh, before I go to the audience question, let me just say something here. I really enjoy、um, uh, three of you.、Uh, And and in in which the architecture is kind of art that、uh, people would say that you have to be there on the spot on the site to experience it. And museum, in a way, is it, it's, it's the same thing.、Um, uh, the chamber of curiosity、um, it, it, it asks you to be there 
to to witness uh, uh, the, the something that's uh, that's wonderful and and and, and strange, uh, so to speak. But when these drawings or models or what have you, uh, the neon cows, for instance, uh, 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 moved into museum, there's another or more than just one. There's uh, all sorts of dimensions that we would uh, we would uh, layered and uh, on top of it, uh, either by uh, the uh, exhibition design that Chris brought up or you know all sorts of dimensions um, that 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 create a distance a defamilization of the of, of the original uh, representation or uh, the object i wonder if uh, any of you uh, like to add uh, something to it i, I just felt that uh, there's so much to explore when when architecture um, um, a, a homeless uh, a, a, a piece of work, as as Chris mentioned earlier, the drawing was created uh, in a way very different from the a painting. That 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 when it got into uh, music museum, it has it, it, it could you could have a, a, a multi dimension to that, and I I am very intrigued by uh, all these things uh, that that uh, three of you brought up. I, I was just wondering uh, if any of you would, would like to ask something to that uh, before I go to the audience questions. Yeah, I have I have something to add. Um, I mean, it's just, it has to, the very simple point, which is the, the, the power of curation. Um, you know, we, it, it's been said that we, as a species, we engage the meaninglessness of the world in a meaningful way. In other words, what we do with things is what gives them meaning. And I think that's a, uh, we could take a, something that has no value. And when it's put in a museum, of course, it, it acquires meaning in a quite a mysterious way because it's, the meaning isn't inherent in the, in the, in the object or the, or the, uh, the, um, Whatever, whatever it is, it doesn't even have to be an object. Um, it, it, can, it can be even an idea, but once it's placed in that setting, uh, it's transformative. And it is not something that's simply layered on top, but it's, it, it becomes part and parcel of what that, uh, what that thing is, whether it, we're talking about a drawing or a model or, or uh, a, a video or uh, some, some memorialization of an event. Um, so that's something that is quite striking, uh, and it's you know why I think um, the 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 question of setting publication, how something is presented, is actually people people miss that as as really being the most important operative element of uh, creating the significance of of objects and uh, and ideas. Yeah. I really should go on to uh, the audience question, but 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 uh, what Chris uh, just brought up with COVID uh, that uh, that uh, keep the uh, you know uh, the uh, museum door shut and and all these. Um, do you three of you have some thoughts of how you moved on? Uh, Eric, you mentioned about digital. Uh, files and all this um, um, I think it's inevitable this question comes up uh, you know what do you do in that with the new normal yes Oliver no just just a um, yeah we, we, we had this um, of course we we all suffered the the, the, the COVID thing in in in, uh, in in the institutions and um, and so uh, my colleague in the education department um, Rebecca Kremershof, she had a great project just um, uh, made possible because um, we have a traditional um, we have a, um, a traditional event coming every year. Um, it's called the construction site of Lego. So it's about it's all about Lego bricks, and uh, we have a super large collection of Lego bricks, just a simple bricks. And um, and so the families come there every every year in summertime and around Christmas, and they they build amazing Lego structures. And so we couldn't do it um, because of the pandemic. And so we just we just took it uh, 
and and uh, without even programming a thing, uh, we just said, okay, Lego is basically um, the same as Minecraft. And so we put up a setting of, of creating this Lego construction site into a, one of the most uh, kind of m most used uh, computer games. It's it's the Minecraft. And so we had the idea of, okay, how, how can we take the idea of Minecraft and bring it together with, with our traditional Lego construction site? And the idea was basically to say, how would Frankfurt look in um, about 80 years? We, we, we said uh, 2000, um, 2099 Frankfurt. So build it, in, build it in Minecraft. And we had fantastic, I mean, we had about 10,000 people joining this Minecraft universe. And, and, and it, 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 it's, it's fantastic. And the results were fantastic. And so it's, um, yeah, I think we, we also, sh we always should see how we could make an easy connection to the, to the digital world. I, I, I doubt this kind of um, programming things, especially that are outdated in two years. And so, I mean, we, it's more like a hijacking of an ex, ex, uh, already existing structure, um, but it worked, it worked fantastic, I would say. Hmm. Great story. <laughs> well, um, maybe I should go to the audience uh, questions uh, for, for now. Um, uh, um, it's a very long uh, question, and um, let me just uh, read it. Um, good evening. I observe there is a significant uh, revolvement around the general ideas of how the presentation of architecture should be done with great consideration of the physical setting of museum galleries. Seeing the success of your re respective institutions in exhibit exhibiting architectural work, I wonder how do museum or how can museum in universities inspire scholarly and scientific discussion regarding the work being presented? That being part one, the first part of the question. Uh, the question comes in three parts. I think I, I stopped it here uh, before we, I go on to the second ones. Any of you would like to? Respond. I think the I, I, I think the the first step is, is is really very straightforward. You 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 make the collection as as accessible uh, and and transparent uh, as possible, and of course, um, you know that 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 is why uh, so many institutions are trying to trying to di trying to digitize uh, as much of their collection as as possible, uh, and make it available uh, and, and and again accessible online. But I I actually think, you know, I, I mentioned. The um, opening of the MVRDV uh, depot for the Boymans Van Boeningen uh, Museum, which is right across from us uh, in, in Rotterdam, and I, I should have shown an image of it. Sorry, but um, it's basically an art storage uh, facility. But it's like a, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's sort of a giant mirrored bowl. Um, <clears throat> uh, but but inside, which is I think the more the more uh, in some ways the, the more interesting part. Um, is that uh, really the, the entire, you know, museums only show like 6% of their collection on, on, on average, you know, at any given time. Um, so what this uh, facility does is actually it makes uh, the storage all visible so you can see the entire um, uh, collection. Um, but you also see the, 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 the back of house. So you see the, the conservation labs and, and the work that's being done and so on and so forth. Now, these are ideas that have been tried out in bits and pieces in different museums over the years you know like the, a, a number of museums have sort of open storage but these are but they tend to be kind of um uh kind of slightly gimmicky afterthoughts right uh there's you know you sort of find a spot and you just call it open storage and people come and isn't this kind of fun um whereas Meanwhile, you know, 95% of the collection is still kind of, you know, hidden away. Here you have the entire collection. And in some ways, I think, um, in some ways, I think this art storage idea uh, ought to be the model for museums. Not so, so, so that it's not that art storage becomes ancillary to the museum function, but in, in many ways, museum functions ought to be, um, ought to uh, grow out of the art storage function. So I, I, you can almost imagine how uh, the depot, if you made it bigger, added more galleries and program space, like that should be the museum of the future. Mm, very good. I think Oliver has uh, something to say too as well. 
No, just uh, just just wanted to add some thought because I mean um, we there are so many projects um, of uh, the digitalization of collections, and so um, I always ask myself if one day we have this kind of we have this website where we have all the we have all the image we have the whole collection it's totally transparent, but what are our questions towards it? <laughs> what shall we? Why did we do it? <laughs> so and 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 I think. I mean, um, the, 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 the most important aspect is, is uh, should not be forgotten that when, when, you, when you have the collection, you always have these kind of questions in mind. You always wanted to ask the, the, your audience or ask scholars or, or bring, bring to the public. And so the, the curation of the digital accessibility is, is, is still an, a, a core issue, I would say, for institutions. So. Oh. Um, that you that you do not enter this kind of okay it is it's almost like the situation what shall i google i mean <laughs> nobody opens google and, and asks i mean you do it for purpose and and so um and so yeah in an in, a, in, a, in an online collection where where does the purpose come from does it come from uh from your scholar background or does it come from the institution itself that says okay today we we show you kind of some aspects of our pieces and, and it's already and then then it's already curated and it's already and you can go deeper and deeper and deeper on your own but it's you have this kind of starting point and this is kind of I would say this is a crucial moment uh, not just to 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 show everything and 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 lose the ability to raise questions um, mm. yeah just okay very good Chris wanted to say something I I said. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, and then this may answer the second part of the question as well, because we, uh, you know, Rhode Island School of Design is a is a is a interesting place because we have a strong legacy of an arts college, and and the architecture program is is one of the very few in the world that are uh, located in an arts college. So, when the show came up in the museum, and it's a teaching museum, the um, you know there was a lot of events around that. There was a lot of uh, uh, so there was a symposium attached to it. There was a publication, of course. And the students really were treated to an experience. They had to come to the museum. Um, they, you know, the whole school came, the whole, the, the, the whole department came. And it was very, I would say, it moved the, the needle on the importance of this kind of work and drawing. That has also suffered through COVID because in the last few years, that memory has disappeared because the students have, be, have been forced to, to um, uh, work remotely and the mentorship from, from student from one class to another mm. has been in a way broken. Mm. So now there's a mm. kind of like, oh, there was a show here. You know, you talk to new students and they, they, they're disconnected. Mm. Anyway, the point, the, the fundamental point I want to make is that we, we know that we will have all images available at all times in the very near future that we would possibly want. So ultimately, the only thing that will have any value is an experience. In other words, people, the, an experience slows you down. And by slowing down, you pay attention. And this is, this is where I think so much work has to happen, which is, which is how do you slow down um, an experience to the point where there, there can be more than a simply a spectacle? Um, which is what becoming is becoming the default operation in you know on the screen, which is just to just to look. Um, and so curation has an incredibly important role to play, which is which is a kind of a slowing down. And you know it's like it's like a great book. It has to draw you in. It has to be compelling. Uh, and that's that's more and more of a challenge, I think, for curation. It's not enough mm. to be didactic or to be mm -hmm. simply, you know, say, here it is. Um, but it will have to become um, basically competitive with people spending most of their time on screen. Very good point, very good point. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to the second part of, uh, of the question. Uh, I, I think that the, the second part is, is, uh, is uh, the first part is about a scholarly discussion. The second part is, is how can these institutions then bring together people from all walks of life and with different roles in the exhibition? Uh, uh, bracket, uh, curators, architects, museum, executives, professionals, the general public, and so on. 
to engage in these discussions. A long question. Well, I mean, this 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 is a question that every museum asks itself with, with every <laughs> yeah. single thing that it does, and 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 there is no sort of clear answer except for the fact that you can't be all things to all people, but museums can be more things to more people, um, and it's just a matter of sort of defining what uh, it's it's really case by case, like sort of what uh, what you're doing certain activities for, um, and also bringing um, sort of folding in different different layers into what you do. Right, like there's a sort of like what 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 uh, Oliver, I I don't know if you guys use this, but uh, at least in American museums, there's this thing about what is it? Um, they use an analogy of swimming. <laughs> you know, there's there's skimming, skimming, swimming, and deep dives. Right, so you sort of do things in a way that um, you know people who you know are, are are curious and interested, but maybe not so don't have so much invested in a in, in a topic, can sort of just come and and you know learn something. Uh, then you have people who maybe want to spend a little bit more time, and uh, then you have people who really want to get get deep into the you know the, the the research and the discourses and so on and so forth. So you just design, you just design your your activities uh, in, in with 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 these more. Uh, I think uh, from my uh, screen, uh, Eric uh, froze. Um, yeah, he yeah. did. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Well, well, let me just go to uh, the uh, let's hope that he will come back. I think we have five minutes left. And the third part of the question, uh, let me sort of uh, 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 rephrase it a little bit um, from your each from uh, your role and, and, and from your institution's point of view. Um, what's your um, uh, what's your goals that you wish to achieve in the future? It's a big question, but uh, but shall we go from oliver first now and maybe chris later i hope eric can come back mm. yeah it's an it's an it's an um like like all of these uh of this kind of multi-facet uh, uh questions it's an, it's an excellent question what are your goals i would say um the the ultimate goal would would be to bring the architecture discourse or the architecture talk uh, right back to society I mean, um, what was essential for us in, in, in brutalism was kind of to link the idea of keeping, um, of keeping those monster buildings, not just because you now should love them because we tell you, but it's the kind of, it's for the, for the pure reason that it's, that it's, that it's because of sustainability issues, you should not demolish uh, any more concrete buildings. And so, yeah, that is the ultimate goal to kind of, to kind of bring your 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 topic in the center of the debate of society or of the debate of politics, and so yeah, mm. to influence these debates. Very good, um, Chris. Okay, sure. Um, I don't know if you can. I am on again. Okay. Well, I would I would say that, um, and this is perhaps less of an institutional goal, but more of a, a, a say a personal um, interpretation of the value of uh, the exhibition of architecture, especially the process of architecture. So my goal would be to, in a way, recapture the the uh, critical importance of the I would say the engagement with with things as generating the thinking of architecture. So these drawings, for example, in the, in the drawing ambiance exhibit are um, not so much to me representations of ideas, but they're the, they're the literally the crucible in which ideas are discovered. So in other words, the means is, the, you know, the, the medium is the message. The means it's are exactly, the way exactly. that ideas come. So this is so important. In a, especially in our, as we become more and more, say, digitized, to understand that only through the engagement of thing, of a medium, of making a mark on a piece of paper, um, or even writing a word, that's the only, that's the moment that something emerges. And uh, I think the false, the false sense of of uh, of, of um, everything we do as being simply a, a representation of what we have already um, thought is a uh, has. I would say has serious cultural 
consequences. And this is what I would say would be the ultimate goal to, in a way, rephrase, recapture the importance of actually doing in order to think, in order to imagine. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, uh, I think Eric has some problem uh, with uh, with the with the connections, and uh, with his new uh, possession at the new institute, it certainly is a big question for him to answer uh, in the future, uh, <laughs> as as he leads uh, the uh, the inst the new institute forward, and with that. Um, I was uh, hoping that in the near future, very near future, I will be able to bring all three of you uh, back um, to have a real uh, experience uh, at JUT. <laughs> and, uh, and then we would ask Eric the questions and I'm sure he, he could give us a great answer. So with that, uh, my appreciation for your time and everything. Um, we are 15 minutes uh, behind the uh, the original, the, uh, 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 you know, end time. But I think w I, we enjoyed it so much. Uh, that's two full hours of discussion. And I just wish that we will be able to, again, uh, bring you back. Right, San San? Well, let's try to do that um, in the future. E Eric has to yes. come back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and... Uh, with that, I uh, appreciate for your time and effort. Uh, and uh, I apologize uh, for the technical problem. Yeah, sorry for that. And then to, uh, to, to the audience, uh, we were running 15 minutes behind. It's, it's me, my, uh, I, I had too much turkey and somehow it, it, it infects my, uh, my computer. So uh, that's the problem uh, we had. Eggnog and, and turkey, that's right. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Oliver. And thank you, Eric, wherever you are. We appreciate your time. And uh, I wish that uh, one day I can visit your neon cow um, in the near future. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. Thank you Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.